Via telephone, Nate Kane. He is a candidate for the second congressional district, a seat currently held by Alex Mooney, who's running for Senate in West Virginia now. Nate, good morning. How are you? Hey, good morning. It's good to be on with you. Great to have you with us, sir. And I know uh, last week, around this time, you were doing a uh, show on Twitter, uh, broadcast about some of the things that happened in the Biden administration that are finally coming to light recently, Nate. Yeah, there's been a lot of really interesting news that's come out. Of course, uh, you know, there's the uh, Comer, uh, Representative Comer, releasing um, uh, some information about uh, Biden's involvement, the Biden crime family involved with uh, money laundering. And uh, and then now, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, the Durham report dropping. And, uh, and it's fascinating. Fascinating. There's some uh, interesting connections there as well. And um, and actually, I have uh, there's some some interesting things on page 78 of that report uh, that specifically speak to the documents that I turned over in my whistleblowing case back you know five years ago when I was with the FBI. Yeah, and let's get into that too, Nate, because I, I know the question that's going to be out there amongst some in our audience who are not completely familiar with you is why is a candidate for a congressional seat who's not an incumbent worried about what Joe Biden is doing? That's your cue right there, Nate. <laughs> well, so so there is there is some some very interesting things that are that are going on uh, in regards to this case with uh, uh, what what the uh, representative Palmer has brought up uh, with uh, Biden. So you know one of one of the things that that I think people need to understand is um, there has been, without a doubt, there has been a, a evidence, and this evidence has come forward. You know, in in this uh, report that came out with Durham. Uh, that the FBI has not handled cases uh, equally. Uh, they have had, uh, you know, cases, of course, that were, you know, not predicated on on um, real facts uh, to where they have gone after Trump and had a, a long, drawn-out uh, investigation pretty much for the entirety, almost the entirety of his, uh, of his uh, four years that was uh, you know, based on lies, based on lies that were, you know, propagated and paid for by uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. And yet at the same time, uh, there was evidence of money laundering with uh, Hillary Clinton. And I think now we're beginning to find out uh, also, too, with these, you know, with this uh, Comer uh, investigation, uh, that uh, there's been evidence that the Biden family has been involved in money laundering. And yet the FBI has pretty much ignored that. So th this is a huge problem because, it, of course, uh, has led, uh, you know, for, I think, and rightfully so, for half of the American people uh, to have no trust whatsoever in our justice system. And that is a big problem. Um, you know, the, the FBI, I think, uh, at this point uh, has has really sullied their, you know, their reputation. And uh, and I think that it's, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a situation now where you have people that, um, you know, have committed criminal activity, that should have been fully investigated and, and honestly, they should have been indicted and brought to trial. And at this point, uh, you know, we're now past the uh, statute of limitations on many of these, uh, you know, cases. And so you have people that are walking free, uh, you know, that never, you know, were, were truly scrutinized. And I mean, the evidence is right there in the, uh, in the report um, that was released by Durham uh, just a couple days ago. John Gilstrap. You just said that you had, that there's evidence in the report, and I have not read the Durham report. Um, evidence that the Biden family, these are your words, Biden family involved in money laundering. That's that's a, a big charge. What is that yeah, evidence? So that, so that, let me make clear, that's not talked about in this report by uh, John Durham. That's being talked about by Representative Comer and uh, in the Oversight Committee, um, you know, that is has been looking into, um, they have a whistleblower, they have several whistleblowers that have come forward, one out of the uh, U.S. Treasury uh, that has come forward with multiple suspicious activity reports. Uh, you know, these are uh, likely FinCents that, you know, have come out. The thing that's interesting about that is that those FinCents, um, those are exactly the same type of documents that I blew the whistle on in regards to the FBI on Hillary Clinton. And so what what's interesting about that is that it seems that there's this pattern within the FBI to completely ignore these things if they have, you know, politically people that are, you know, people that are politically connected with the Democrat Party, uh, they've, you know, they've totally ignored it. And in, case, and in fact, in the case of uh, Hillary Clinton, and it's 
speaks to this right here on page uh, 78 of the um, of the the Durham report. It says uh, beginning in January 2016, three different FBI field offices, uh, the New York field office, the Washington field office, and the Little Rock field office open investigations into possible criminal activity involving the Clinton Foundation. Uh, the the uh, Little Rock Field Office case opening communication referred to an intelligence product and corroborating financial uh, reporting that a particular commercial, quote, industry-like engaged in federal public official, engaged a federal public official in a flow of benefit scheme, namely large monetary contributions were made to a nonprofit under both direct and indirect control of the federal of the federal public official in exchange for favorable government actions and or influence. I mean, that, that, that is a pay-to-play scheme. Uh, that is what a lot of people, uh, you know, we're talking about, including uh, uh, Peter Schweitzer, who wrote the book Clinton Cash. And what, what's interesting is that, you know, I, I turned over, I, I know the documents they're talking about there because those are the documents I turned over. The, the uh, intelligence report was based on uh, what the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence senior staffer had asked me to go back in and get because they were investigating uranium one and they wanted evidence of that you know what the fbi knew about the russians attempting to infiltrate our uranium supply chain at the time that uh that uranium one was sold off uh to rossatom and that was approved by the the Scythius committee so the the other documents that they're talking about the financial documents those were fincents that already had analyst notes that uh, spoke of a, a, credi- a high credibility of criminal activity in relation to money laundering, securities and exchange fraud, uh, public corruption, and terrorism financing being ran out of those specific offices. So I'm almost, I would say I'm 90% sure that what they're talking about here are the documents that I turned over. And, and these were documents that the FBI had, but if you go down further down into the report down on page 80 it says that on august 1st 2016 a video teleconference meeting was held where in uh, washington field office and little rock field office cases were directed to be closed and consolidated into new york field office investigation and this was uh, ordered by uh, andrew bicade and then eventually he wanted the whole thing closed and so th- this the only reason that they wanted this thing closed was because they were afraid that hillary clinton was going to be president and so they did not want any repercussions coming back on them. You know, again, though, they had a completely different uh, uh, reaction to, um, you know, to, you know, to salacious allegations that were made against Trump, you know, than where they took the case, you know, that was basically paid for and funded by, uh, you know, the, the Clinton campaign. And, and then they ended up, uh, you know, funding this investigation to hamstring, you know, President Trump. So I don't doubt one for one minute that the same type of stuff was going on with the Biden administration. I mean, we got to remember, you know, the Biden laptop. We found out later that the FBI paid three million dollars to Twitter to suppress that story, and uh, you know they had access to to be able to suppress stories, to you know ban accounts or suggest you know which accounts to be banned, and uh, and they of course you had media all over the place that was basically saying that, you know, the the Hunter Biden laptop was a fake story. Well, now, now it turns out, no, it wasn't a fake story. It was a legit story. And then on top of that, you had, uh, you had FinCEN's and money laundering, uh, you know, evidence of money laundering that was going on within the Biden administration while he was, while he was vice president. And so what I'm saying is that I think that the two are tied together. There's, so if, so if we, just for the sake of argument, stipulate that all of it is true, you know, that that Trump was treated unfairly, that the, the laptop was ignored and paid off and all of that. You're running for national office now. Put it this as a boss used to tell me, put that in the form of a recommendation. So what what do you what should we do about this? Other than well, recognize that it happened and yeah. and get a little angry, but then now, what do we do so about there, it? There is something that can be done. I, I for one, do not believe for one minute that uh, that the FBI will ever investigate themselves. I don't believe that the, the Department of Justice is going to indict 
you know, themselves or one of their, you know, sub agencies. So I think that there is something in the Constitution uh, that can be done. I don't think that the current form of the Congress would do it at this stage, but possibly in the next one. And I hope to be there to be able to be a part of it. But I believe that we need what's called an Article One tribunal, which is uh, a, a basically an Article One court. Um, I talked about this, I think, in the first interview that I did with you guys. And this is something that already exists. The We have the U.S. tax court as a perfect example of it. But I think that this purpose is, I believe, what the founders intended for it, which is where you have corruption within the courts, you have corruption uh, within the Justice Department. The, the point of this would be to adjudicate agency issues. And so you have massive abuses of power. You have massive, uh, you know, corruption within the DOJ and within the FBI. I think this is the perfect example of where Congress needs to appoint uh, a, you know, a, basically a set of judges that are not contaminated or corrupted by, by the judicial system. You know, these can be people who are, you know, retired admirals or generals or people who are, are you know, have, uh, have, have a good sense of, of understanding, you know, of the law, that have a good moral, you know, code, uh, but that are not tainted by any of this uh, problem. But they need to, they need to essentially adjudicate, uh, you know, where there has been, um, uh, where there's been abuses of power. And the abuses of power that I'm talking about primarily uh, are in relation to, you know, people who essentially influenced the media, influenced Twitter and social media to suppress certain stories. Um, you know, that, that is illegal. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it is the federal government essentially interfering uh, with free speech. And, uh, and I think that's something that needs to be adjudicated. You also had, uh, as we found out with uh, Tucker Carlson, too, uh, he interviewed uh, Elon Musk, and Elon Musk said that while uh, when he went into Twitter, he found that, that uh, you know, the intelligence community had total access to everything. Again, they were, they were he, he said, to include our DMs, which is direct messages for those that aren't aware of Twitter, these are private messages between people, and he said yes. And uh, I would assume that he meant without warrant. And that is a violation of Fourth Amendment. So I think that those things, uh, I think these issues related to uh, the FBI and, and uh, you know, the way they've conducted themselves, the way they've essentially politicized, uh, you know, the, um, the Department of Justice and the FBI, and not just politicize the FBI, but it's also about those tools that are used to spy. This article uh, that was, or the report that was dumped by, um, by uh, uh, Durham, it gets into great deal about how FISA was misused and, and FISC in particular. And, you know, this is the, the Foreign uh, Intelligence Surveillance Corps. The fact that you had Carter Page, um, you had a, a, a lawyer, a Sussman, who lied in order to get, um, he basically changed a form uh, to, to, he added a word uh, not in front of, you know, basically that uh, a statement that Carter Page was working for the CIA and, you know, as an informant. And, and that made him, uh, you know, that, that by that one single change, it caused a judge to allow for a FISA to be used against him. And again, this is violations, you know, of his, uh, you know, of his right to, uh, to be free of search and seizure, you know, without a probable cause and a, and a search warrant and all of that. The thing is, is that there is a federal law right now in the books that I have not seen used uh, very often at all, but it is um, deprivation of rights under color of law. And I think that, quite frankly, uh, they need to go after these people who have committed these crimes for that. Um, deprivation of rights under color of law, uh, you know, it has a, uh, it, it has a, it, it, it has a penalties that go all the way up to and including the death penalty. You know, and that's, of course, in the case of somebody losing their life uh, you know, in the commission of having their rights deprived of them. So I think these are things that, that you know, so that, that, you know, brings up the point of, you know, is it possible that this law uh, doesn't even have, you know, a statute of limitations because it, it does have include with it the death penalty. So these are things that I think that Congress needs to look at. I think uh, the fact that the statute of limitations has ran out on some of these crimes, of course, treason doesn't have any, uh, you know, there's no, statute of limitations on that. Racketeering has a 10-year statute of limitations. I think that that should be considered 
uh, you know, against some of these crimes that were you know, involving multiple um, organizations, especially in regards to Clinton. I mean, that one that one statement that I read earlier, it, it flat out calls it a you know an industry, uh, likely engaging in federal public official uh, in uh, the flow of benefits scheme. That whole thing there with multiple, um, or dealing with multiple nonprofits, uh, I think uh, you know would would rise to the standard of uh, of uh, a RICO case. Nate, I happen to have a, a prosecuting attorney on the staff today here, Matt Harvey. Yeah, Go I'd, right ahead. I'd be very interested to hear his opinion on this. Well, Mr. Kane, I haven't I haven't reviewed the report, um, and, and it sounds like you have. So, with with the with the Durham investigation report, was there some prosecutions that came out of that? Yes, there were two prosecutions that came out of it, and ultimately both of them failed. One of them was on Sussman. I honestly believe the case, especially on Sussman, was was a solid case. But the problem is, is that these cases were tried in Washington D.C., and as you know, um, you know, a, a case tried against a Democrat in D.C. isn't going to go anywhere. But a case tried against a Republican yeah. in D.C. Is going to get a 97, you know, percent conviction rating, as we're seeing with January 6th and the people that have been prosecuted there unfairly. I believe. Um, I think that you know what we're seeing there is a, a total miscarriage of justice. No, I, I, I don't, I, sir. I have a, I have a profound respect for juries, and I believe they get it right most of the time. Um, on this Comer investigation, um, isn't haven't they hit a snag recently? They've hit a snag uh, only in the sense that uh, there's a couple of their witnesses that have gone missing, or one of their main witnesses, he's disappeared. They can't find him. And uh, there's been a couple of other witnesses, I think, that have been, um, that the Justice Department has, you know, worked to suppress their, you know, their ability to testify or something like that. So I don't know the exact details of that, so I need to look into that. But Yeah, you're not, is is there a belief that the person has, that the uh, informant has been, um, uh, in, a, in a bad way, m- made to disappear, you know, they've been rubbed out, or that, or is it just somebody that, that's keeping their head down on purpose? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that the person's, you know, been, you know, disappeared in a bad way necessarily. Um, it could just be that they're in hiding. Um, look, I mean, I, I was a whistleblower myself. Um, I had at least, uh, you know, one time for certain and, and possibly two times that I was poisoned. I had, uh, you know, of course, I was targeted and, and had the FBI show up at my house and raid my home. Um, you know, so, I mean, I've had a lot of, you know, that, that going through the process of doing this was a very scary situation. And, uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I had to retain counsel. Um, I was never charged. And, uh, you know, and I maintained my clearance without even a, a single, um, you know, blip on my, my clearance. I never had it suspended. But it still was a very scary situation because I was, you know, I had dealt with, you know, classified information. I did everything, you know, according to the law, uh, you know, that I could, you know, do that I, I knew of. But can, you never know. Can, I mean, like, a, as Bill Barr said, you know, uh, the FBI can indict a ham sandwich if they want to. Well, he, he, he <laughs> that's been around a lot longer than Bill Barr, that saying. Uh, but but it, it, the point's taken. Um, so just for the nuance, what is there a... Can you explain the difference between a whistleblower and an informant? Are they mutually exclusive? Can they be both? Um, when you hear those terms mentioned, how do you interpret them? Well, you know, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I hear a lot of times I hear people referred to as whistleblowers that are not whistleblowers. In fact, what they are is leakers. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the big difference that I've seen, and then there's also informants. And so um, a, a whistleblower is somebody, in my opinion, and, and this is just my opinion, is somebody who goes through the formal process of the, you know, either the Whistleblower Protection Act or the uh, Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, which is the one that I went under because I was a, a federal contractor, and so WPA didn't apply to me. Um, it, to me, all three are kind of necessary, you know? I mean, it's like I prefer there not to be leaks, and, and, and the, the information that I was dealing with was classified, so there was no way I was going to the press with that information. Um, I went through a very formal process of taking it to uh, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and there were very specific steps I had to take. But essentially what I did was I walked out of the FBI with classified documents. Now, I had a courier card, and I handed those documents off to 
uh, you know, a member of the uh, a senior staff member to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Then they asked me to go back in and get more information. And so in a way, at that point, they kind of turned me into an informant, you know, because I was under uh, the protection of the HIPSI. But when I came back out, they left me hanging because they cut me off from comms. And I still to this day don't know what happened there. But I had to then go through the formal process of becoming a, a official whistleblower through the ICWPA. And, uh, and I went through uh, uh, DOJ IG Horowitz. And, uh, and I got, you know, protection under the ICWPA, uh, which unfortunately the ICWPA does not protect against reprisal. Um, it does protect you, you know, gives you some protection against uh, prosecution, but, um, you know, it doesn't protect you against reprisal. Uh, a leaker, on the other hand, really has no protection at all because they're coming forward. And this is like what Edward Snowden did. Um, you know, he, he essentially, in, the, in the, the generalized term, you know, he blew the whistle on on what he believed, you know, was was bad stuff that was going on in NSA, but but he didn't do it through a process that was legal. He essentially brought that information to the press, and while there's been law that's been settled on, you know, whether or not uh, a, a newspaper or or the media can publish leaked documents, which you know, of course, the you know the famous one, uh, uh, you know, the Pentagon Papers, of course, you know, they were you know had had published, and uh, but the fact is is that uh, they can you know, they won't go after and, and prosecute the person who publishes it. They will go after and prosecute the person who leaks it. And we saw that in the case of Edward Snowden. Uh, we saw that in the case of, um, of, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, the guy that, that, uh, leaked the, the documents, uh, related to the, uh, bunch of cables within the, uh, U.S. military and Pentagon. Oh, recently, the recent guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, the recently, yeah, you have that, the recent guy that just leaked. The Air Force guy? Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I was talking about, uh, oh, the, the, this was also, there was also uh, another woman who had, who had published something under the Trump administration, uh, leaked a document to um, to the press uh, on a military operation, and uh, she had kind of an interesting name, too. And, and again, all these people leaked these documents to the press, and so all of them ended up ultimately going to jail. Um, you know, when you go through whistleblowing, you know, whistleblower protection, and you go through this process, you're not taking it to the press, you're taking it to, you know, the oversight committees who essentially are supposed to be monitoring, you know, whether it's the judiciary oversight or whether it is the intelligence community uh, oversight or, you know, various other, uh, you know, congressional groups. But but that's, that's really the big takeaway from this is that if you're going to blow the whistle, do it in a way that is legal because eventually – you know, what's going to happen is, um, you know, if you take it to uh, Congress, Congress can then bring that out into the public, and then you can talk about it. And uh, and that's really, I think, you know, I think something that is, is important. But, you know, people have to make their own decisions on this. I mean, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about uh, you know, Snowden, for example. I mean, I think the way he did it was not, you know, was not right. I think that he made some mistakes that uh, ultimately put, um, you know, some of our military operations and things in, in, you know, in danger. But, um, but at the end of the day, I think the, the main point that he was trying to bring out was critically important for the American people to know about, which is that the, uh, the government had taken 9-11 and, and had used that as a means of being able to push for uh, you know, intelligence surveillance on the American people that violates the Constitution. Matt Harvey, so, final question. So, yeah. Mr. Kang, we, we, we've, uh, gosh, we've talked a lot about these national issues, and we haven't, and you, you're uh, a candidate for the congressional seat here in West Virginia. So I'm going to ask you just one question about West Virginia. Um, do you eat your hot dogs with or without coleslaw? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. Does uh, the sauerkraut count? <laughs> Not in West Virginia. It <laughs> well, I got to be honest with you, Harvey. I hate coleslaw and sauerkraut, so I don't put them anywhere near mine. <laughs> this is this is one I, of the I, most controversial <laughs> topics in West Virginia. I don't, I don't think so I've I ever tried a hot right dog now. with coleslaw. Um, I, I do like sauerkraut, but I don't think I've ever tried one with coleslaw. So I don't know about any you know in putting anything on my on my hot dog that has any kind of uh, <laughs> sweetness. I'm not into the sweet relish either. So Nate, I appreciate your time this morning, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nate Kane at uh, 901.